that's the one? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, the last slide. There. What's the one we say? Every word of God is pure? Is that what it was? Hmm. All right. Well, it's a good day in the church. The church prays. Yes. Thank you for praying. Thank you for praying. Well, let's put some closure on what we've heard already. Um, so I'm not sure this really ties into what we've been hearing already this morning. Um, I just want to take you to a couple places, and I'll probably just add to this next week. Uh, vision statement one, we'll call it vision statement today. Um, but we're still in John 1.14, of course. to the point where we're saying that is the key verse of the book of John, but we're um, I'm pretty sure about that. That, that is the message. That is the cure. Amen. That's the cure. You guys have been talking about cure all morning. Uh, knowing the truth, the testimony, the, the word, the purpose. I mean, what word do you want to throw in there? The, the message. Uh, the message is that God came in the flesh. And if God doesn't come in the flesh, there's no, there's no cross, right? There's no, there's no cure. Uh, so that's, that's got to be the big deal here. Uh, so that's why we were saying things like uh, our purpose. Uh, our purpose has, has come to be uh, the fact that we are to be one with Jesus. That's your created purpose. You are to be the house, the temple of God. Uh, of course, John 1.14 speaks to that. Uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace, grace and truth, right? Grace and truth. God's, God's love is truth. Uh, it's right there. It's beautiful. Uh, so from the purpose, we went to uh, the idea of this moving this whole kingdom structure series. Uh, what does the structure of the kingdom look like? And we said things like, well, if, if Jesus is the king of the kingdom, uh, then Jesus is, uh, the cross has got to be the, the structure of the kingdom. That's, that's the foundational structure of the kingdom. So that makes Jesus the foundation of the kingdom. Uh, this year we, um, we changed our, our vision, it seems, our vision statement. And we made this our vision statement, this, this question here. Uh, Jesus asked the question, what do you want me to do for, translated, what do you want me to do in and through you? And that changes things in regard to vision, to what you can see. Again, when it says we beheld, that's, the, that's a seeing, one of many seeing words. Uh, we used to have a lot of different types of statements for vision, vision statements. Uh, it's a big thing, especially in the church growth movement, this idea of um, having a vision. What's your vision? Of course, it makes biblical sense if you understand what vision really means. Uh, Proverbs chapter 29 uh, is really a, a foundation for all this. You can put that really on the top of your paper there, maybe between the proposition and number one there. Uh, it can all flow from this as well. Proverbs 29.18. And so many of you know that uh, verse by heart already. Um, Proverbs 29.18. Where there is no vision, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Uh, the people perish. There's, they die. I like New King James uh, translation, revelation. Uh, but to understand that, this is what this vision is. Without vision, 
without a vision, without a revelation, the people perish. They cast off restraint. They begin not to give a rip. <laughs> they, you know, they cast off their restraint. Uh, they don't stay in uh, God's plan and purpose for their life. Um, they don't stay in God's protective boundary for them, covered in His blood. They step out uh, into their own way of doing things again. You've all been there and done that. You know the difference between living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and walking in the flesh. It's that kind of idea. Uh, we've tried to come up with different vision statements over the years. Uh, but this one really encapsulates what, what the truth of what he's saying here. This idea of vision. Um, you, you may have heard this before. There isn't an, an anonymous quote out there. Uh, a lot of the church growth gurus like to use it. Uh, Blessed is the man who finds out which way God is moving and then gets going in the same direction. That's an anonymous quote. There's a simple problem with that, though. I mean, it helps me to clarify church growth and kingdom growth. The problem is that it's the whole idea of this word vision. Vision. You've had a vision before. Uh, especially that night, uh, you came over and ate pizza at my house late. Had eight pieces. Remember? You had to uh, finish off a couple two liters. Went home. It's all percolating and gurgling inside. You go home, and about three o'clock in the morning, you get this vision. You have a vision, you have a dream. Uh, brought upon you by the uh, overindulgence of pizza and soft drinks. Yeah. Uh, there's a vision. Uh, that's not this kind of vision <laughs> in Proverbs. That's not the kind of vision that, that John is leading them to, that John has, has seen. This and this is why New King James translator rep, translates this word revelation. Uh, vision is almost always signifies a, a divine revelation. If it's divine, where does it come from? God. God's right. Yeah. Uh, also, if you think about this definition. The primary essence of the word is, is not so much the vision or, or what you see in the vision. Um, you may have a vision that says, hey, I see myself uh, in this place so many years from now. Or, or I see myself receiving this abundance from God in this particular time. You may have those kind of pictures in your mind. The primary essence of the word used here in Proverbs is not so much the vision or the dream even, the dream that you have received. Uh, you know, I have a dream. But the, the primary essence of it, it it's the message that's being conveyed. It, it, how can I explain this better? It, it signifies the direct specific communication between God and the hearer. See, it's kind of like the two points we're trying to draw here. Seeing to see. It's one thing to see, and it's another thing to, to know. And to know would be like to, to see with the eyes of your heart. I mean, it's one thing to, to see that beautiful shirt that John's wearing over there, right? But it's, a, it's another thing to really desire that shirt and, and you know, want it for yourself and want to participate in that shirt. It's a big difference. So it, it really comes back to the great word that we love to use around here called source. Source. Uh, you can see something. And, and think it's a, a vision or a dream. 
Or you could see something and say, well, that, that, that must be from God. It, it looks good. It, it smells good. It, it tastes good. So uh, there's no GMOs in it, so it must be good. Amen. It must be from God. Well, there's a problem with that. See, if we can't see, if we're just going to see to see, then we're going to miss the source of what we're seeing. Where does it come from? Seeing to see or knowing to see. So let's, let's look at some scriptures real quick. Let's just go right back to Genesis first. I was going to leave me that way anyway, about with my comment. Uh, Adam and Eve. Um, Adam, of course, uh, uh, has a vision. Adam is uh, birthed. Uh, from a vision of God. God has a vision and He creates man. Let us make man in our image. He creates man. God creates man. He breathes the breath of life into man. This purpose for Adam to be the, the house of God. Literally, God's Spirit breathed into Adam and life was created. Adam is given a, a direction, command, in chapter 2. Uh, he is to tend and keep, this is chapter 2, verse 15. Adam is to tend and keep the garden. He needs to oversee the garden, tend to it, and keep it. Take care of it. Oversee it. Uh, God's bringing the, the growing. God's, God's already planted this garden. He doesn't even have to work in this idea of planting. He's just to, to tend to it. Cultivate it. Keep it. You move into chapter 3, of course. Well, before you get to chapter 3, of course, uh, the, the woman uh, is, is created. Uh, first time we see something that is not good in all of God's creation shows up here. Chapter 2, verse 18, God says, It is not good. First thing He says that's not good is that man uh, should be alone. Amen. So remember that. We were you guys prayed about it. You've cried out about it already today about not being alone about this idea. And this is where our world is. In, in the advent of all of our tweeting and, and Facebooking and all of our messaging and everything we are, People seem to be more lonely than ever before. Yes. More lonely. Because why? Because it's, it's, we're only seeing it with our eyes. It's only superficial relationship stuff. I don't even have to talk to you. You don't have to hear my voice anymore. I can tweet it to you. I can tweet you a message. I can email you a message. And we can have a relationship and you'd never ever have to hear my voice again. Some of you are saying amen. Whoa. That's the advent of all this technology. It's not good, though. There are some good aspects to it. But left alone, without any accountability to it, it's not good. And God says in 2.18, It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. And God does that. And again, let's listen to all these like visionary wordings that he uses. 
Uh, Adam goes into a, he's caused to go into a deep sleep. Chapter, uh, verse 21, uh, he, he took, God took a, a rib in his flesh, closed the flesh, took the rib, created a woman, made, he made into a woman, this rib. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, or in the old days, whoa, man. And because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's, it's, it's a purpose stuff, right? It's, it's vision stuff. Uh, now in chapter 3, you move into chapter 3 here. Uh, the serpent comes on the scene. He's more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he says to a woman, he begins to cast a, a vision he speaks to the woman. Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor shall touch it, shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. He's, he's casting this vision, isn't he? He's, he's painting this picture. Uh, this, this is God's creation, he's saying, right? This is God's garden. It's His fruit. And surely if you eat of it, why would you die? For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Talk about organic, right? that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now isn't it interesting? Uh, because isn't that part of what the vision is about is to allow you to see I mean, you want a vision so you can see. Because the scripture says without a vision, you'll perish. Without revelation, you'll perish. Yes. But isn't it interesting that they received revelation, they received a vision, yet there was a perishing that went on here. See, if they only were there to see, you see what the problem is here that they saw, they just looked at the superficial part of the vision. It, it looks good, it smells good, it tastes good, the tree's good, it's in God's garden, it must be good. Why not? It's obvious that there's a difference between the sources of these two visions that have been given, these words, these dreams, whatever you want to put there, from these two sources. Um, here's an example. I found these in uh, Jeremiah. Keep going back to the left a bit. I think it's left. No, no. To the right, sorry. Jeremiah chapter 14. Here's one, one example. Two in Jeremiah, I'll give you. Look what's going on here in Jeremiah. Uh, this you can put right under the scene to see. That's Genesis 3 is a verse there. Let me get a chance to write it all out for you. Jeremiah 14, verse 14 in particular, and then Jeremiah 23, 16. Put those all under number one. Jeremiah 14, 14. Look what it says. Jeremiah said, Oh, and the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. That's what God's saying to Jeremiah. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. You get that? 
that looks just like Genesis 3. Surely God wouldn't kill you. He's a, he's a God. He's a loving God. I mean, surely he wouldn't kill you. Uh, I mean, I've seen this guy on TV. He's got millions of followers. Surely he wouldn't be saying something that doesn't line up with Jesus and his word. But back in Jeremiah's time, God says, The prophets prophesied lies in my name, God said. I have not sent them. I have not commanded them. I have not spoken to them. They prophesied to you a false vision. Divination a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. I'll turn over to 23 for another example. Same thing. That's a huge, absolutely huge. This helps explain a little bit more. 23.16 Thus says the Lord of hosts, 23.16, Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. Interesting, isn't it? It has to do with source, doesn't it? Where the source of this vision is coming from. Hey, it could look good. It could sound good. It could be uh, profitable. Uh, it could make all the business sense in the world. Yet, the problem is what? It just wasn't from God. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal, don't you think? Yeah. Well, man, you can say, well, maybe God will get over it. You know, we'll just go on it. You know, let him catch up with us this time. <laughs> it is funny. Yeah. Uh, see, so the big deal with vision isn't like, okay, we all get around the circle and, and we have dinner together and we pray real hard and, and we look at our community and say, okay, what, what do we do here to, to reach our community? Then we came up with, you know, five ideas and say, well, you know, we've got a bunch of these kind of people, so we need to reach them. We've got a, a bunch of these kind of people, so we need to reach them. And, well, you know, we don't have this in our city, so maybe we could be that. We don't have this in our city, so maybe we could be that. I'm not sure if that's quite right. I'm thinking, why don't we just get into him? Why don't we just get into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? What if, if the, I mean, if the structure of the kingdom, and the foundation of the structure is Jesus, then in the structure of the kingdom, maybe the vision is just Jesus. Maybe he's the vision. And that may work itself out in different areas of our lives and in ministries in our in our churches. But if but if vision is more concerned about, I mean, if this divine revelation word is more concerned about the source than the actual vision itself. And it seems to me that if we get all caught up in the visions and the dreams, instead of getting all caught up in the in the him, we could be misled and deceived. See, it's easy for me to say, oh, oh, I got these visions, I got these dreams, and now that I have this, I can do those things. And wouldn't this be great? Wouldn't that be marvelous? I, I think it sounds good, so maybe God would be okay with it. So we try to force that into maybe God's plan instead of us just immersing ourselves into Him so that He can flow that vision through us. Oh.
Let's look at the opposite of that. Knowing to see. I'm going to take you to Paul's road to Damascus experience, but I want to take you to the, the other account, another one of the other accounts that he gives in regard to it. It's all the way over in Acts chapter 26. Paul gives this account, I think it's at least three times, I'm pretty sure, of, uh, about this road to Damascus experience. And in, in 26, chapter 26, he is permitted uh, to speak uh, by King Agrippa. Now it's interesting what happens to Paul. Paul's given this, this vision. Uh, Paul is, has heard the voice from God. He has heard the, the very words of Jesus. And look how he, how he gives this account here. Um, he goes back, just verse 4, we'll start there. He goes, My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now, we say Pharisee today, and it's, it's really a negative connotation for most evangelicals. If an evangelical calls you a Pharisee, they're, they're not giving you a, a compliment. But when you would talk about being a Pharisee before Jesus brought it to Revelation, uh, it's not so much that being a Pharisee is bad, it's the source of your Phariseeism that's bad. <laughs> right? Because he pointed that out too. He didn't say, you know, you guys are, you guys are bad because you're Pharisees. He said, you're, you're bad because there's a source in you. You're of your father, the devil. There's a source. There's a problem in the sourcing of why you're doing what you're doing. Yes. So, so technically, Paul is like, he's, he's like a head guy. I mean, he's, he's the president of the seminary. Man. I mean, he's, you know, he's the, you know, Pope-like. He's, you know, General Superintendent. I mean, he's a big, big deal here. Uh, I stand here judged, and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise, right? To this promise. That, that vision that was casted, God's promise, so many years ago. To this promise our twelve tribes earnestly serving God day and night hope to attain for his hope's sake. This hope's sake. King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? God raises the dead. How can God raise the dead? Isn't that a direct lining up to John 1.14? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul can't say God raises the dead if Jesus doesn't come in the flesh, goes to the cross, dies, and is born again. Or raised again, right? Can't say it. But now he can say it now because of John 1.14. What happened? How John explains 1.14. God took on flesh. Uh, so he tells, you know, he gives the whole history lesson again of his testimony. And then he, then he gets to the part of Damascus, verse 12. While thus occupied as a journey to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. I mean, he's got authority, he's got purpose, he's got vision on why he's doing what he's doing. But at midday, verse 13, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. And you know how bright that is. Because everybody's tried to look into the sun at least once in their lifetime. Yes. So if that's so bright you can't look right into it without burning your... Right. 
that he says this light is even brighter. This light, the light that John referred to in, one, in chapter 1 again, where we looked at that already, about the light. This light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goad. So I say, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise up. Stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. I have a, appeared to you. You can see me. For this purpose. To make you a minister. And a witness. Both of the things which you have seen. And of the things which I have will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn from turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to the power of God. Two sources, right? That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, here it is, verse 19 again, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. There's the word. I was not disobedient to it. But he took the vision in what, verse 20? Declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works benefiting repentance. Paul didn't come up with this on his own. Right? I mean, this is not from Paul. This vision. And we translate it, heavenly vision. See, he had a vision before. He was given, he was commissioned with authority from the chief priests. So it's not a, like a right thing and a wrong thing. Because what he was doing before Jesus showed up with his commissioning power and authority, he was doing. It was okay. I mean, if you can say that. He wasn't, he wasn't technically doing anything wrong. He was living out the vision that he was given. The problem with the vision was what? The source of the vision. That's the problem. Jesus shows up on the scene. Now he's given a, another vision, empowered, commissioned. And this heavenly vision, he says, is I am not disobedient to this vision. Looks like he wasn't disobedient to the other vision. So it's not about right and wrong here. It's about source of the vision. It's the source. It's the, where is this vision birthed? Where does it come from? There's many, as he reminded us in Jeremiah again, that they're coming in my name. And Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? Um, where's that one? Matthew 7? Yes, that's a good one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who is or does, this is on the board here, he who becomes the will, he who, who embraces, he who sinks into, he who is filled with the Holy Spirit. He who is the will, not just goes and does the will, he who is the will, God doing it in and through you. That's different. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I'll declare to them, never knew you. Never knew you. There was no intimacy there. No relationship there. Because you practice lawlessness. I mean, this is the same M.O. for every situation that we see lived down in the Scripture. Whether you're Ananias and Sapphira, whether you are uh, called a disciple in John 666 of all verses, huh? Interesting verse. We haven't gotten there yet in our study, but as you come up, you see these healings. The nobleman's sons healed. Uh, the woman at the well was healed. There was a uh, water to, was turned into wine. Miracle. The woman at the well was healed. Miracle. The nobleman's son healed. Miracle. The pool of Bethesda. The uh, lame man's healed. Miracle. 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 Uh, feeding. Miracle in chapter 6. Feeding in the 5,000. And look what happens. You get the feeding in the 5,000. And then you get Jesus walking on the water. Are you seeing this? All this physical stuff happening. Wait a minute. That was water. Look at it. It's, it's purple now. I don't know how I did it, but I can see it. It's right there in that cup. Yeah. Whoa. The nobleman went home and said, wait a second. The, the servants are there. He was sick at around the seventh hour. Uh, Jesus spoke, said he's going to be healed. What time was he healed? It was about the seventh hour. Amen. Physical seeing, physical healing, physical, 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 right? All the way through. Jesus walks on water. Feeding them 5,000. There's leftovers plus women and children. Hey, 5, 15,000 people are fed. And there's 12 baskets left over for tomorrow for lunch. Nice. And look what, look what, you get down to the six, and they got, you got people complaining about this. Um, that Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. This is 641. And then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Oh, that makes them so mad. I'm the bread of life. That's like me saying, Jesus is the vision. Same thing. I'm the bread of life. If Jesus is the bread of life, then Jesus is the vision. He's the vision. There's nothing else for us to see except Him. And through all of this, and here He's calling us, I'm the bread of life. And he's calling us to this intimacy. You want to know this vision? You want to get in on this vision? you got to get into me. Because I'm the vision. Eat of my flesh. Drink of my blood. It's the Spirit that gives life. Spirit that gives life. Look what he says. This is uh, six, starting um, 661. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples... The disciples, even, disciples are complaining after all this. Six chapters of miracles, signs, and wonders. Whoa. And somebody's complaining? Yep. Somebody's not raising their hands when they're singing? Whoa. Come on. Somebody's not telling somebody that there's this cure out there and Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the cure. And somebody has the audacity not to share it. Somebody's still so stuck on themselves and stuck in their way and stuck in their own theology. And he says, says to them, well, does, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The Spirit. You can see it, but not really believe it. Because the Spirit is not 
God-bearing testimony with your spirit about it. We know that. We've seen people raised from the dead. You've seen miracles in your very own family. Yes. But yet, it's the Spirit who gives life. Not the fact that you saw the miracle that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. That might be why after He showed them on the Mount of Transfiguration the great vision and sign that they come on down and He says, now don't you boys tell anybody about this. Why wouldn't they tell anybody about it? Or why shouldn't they? Because it has not been birthed within them. Right? It's not inside them. Oh, you've seen it. But I'm not sure if you really know it. If it's not really inside of you. And that's been the knock on Christianity because of church growth. This message of Jesus is not really the message. He's not really the purpose. He's not really the vision. We have other things to take his place. Verse 63 again. So it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. You, you know, you, you said it. Well, if I could just see it, I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. You're only going to believe it when you can see it with your soul, man. With your heart. It's not just a a physical seeing. It's an inside deal seeing. And that's what messes me up because I get all focused on the physical stuff. And I miss the whole, the real purpose. The real vision. The real truth. For there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. What does that mean? The Father draws you, man. Spirit draws you. So you could see it and really not see it. You know what I mean by that, right? So you could know me, but then you could really know me. Right. The intimacy stuff. And look how he ends it up there. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Oh, no blue ribbon this year, baby. Damn, attendance just tanked on John 666 here. <laughs> From that time, he here's the truth. Signs, miracles, wonders, done. And he says, okay, uh, the reason why this is happening is not just so that you can just see it, but so that you could see it. It's got to be an inside deal. And we all can give an example of that. And then Jesus turns to the twelve now. So now that AM, AM uh, worship is just tanked, now he's down to 12. <laughs> he's back to the original, not familiar? He's back to the original 12. Whoa. And then he says to them, uh, do you also want to go away? Hmm. Hey man, we're your supporters. We've been here since the beginning, right?
but it's an inside deal. Uh, so I, I've got to see like this. Because sometimes in our, in our church life, sometimes in our prayer life, we, we, we lay out that fleece kind of thing, or we, we make uh, uh, ultimatums, uh, you know, prayerful demands to Jesus and say, okay, uh, it, God, if you just do this for me, Jesus, I will believe once and for all. You know, I mean, come on. God, if you, if you just heal me one more time, I promise I'll start tithing. If Jesus, if you just, you know, if you just make my mom say this to me, I, I promise I'll, I'll be a good girl and boy. I mean, if you just, I mean, Jesus, if you just, just let her cook one meal without burning it, I, I promise I'll do the dishes, you know, that kind of stuff. Those prayerful demands we make. Whoa. Because we want to see these things. If we can just see it, then we believe it. But that is not true here, is it? So uh, the question, what's your vision statement then? Because that's not true. Because Thomas said, if I could just see, I'd believe. And Jesus was like, well, Thomas, it's really not about this kind of seeing that you're talking about. Because blessed are those who have not seen physically, but they've seen spiritually, haven't they? They've seen within their hearts. You know, it's like that story we were reading, oh man, back in Matthew, one more, two more real quick. You know, uh, and the mother, she's there, mother of the, of the boys, you know, um, was it uh, James and uh, John's mom, right? She's there, and, and we said, uh, which one was it? And she's like, wait a second, uh, you know, uh, which which son's going to be on my right? You know, oh yeah, twenty, yeah, twenty and twenty-one. Yeah. Uh, the mother of the sons of Emily, chapter twenty, verse twenty. Look at this. Look at this picture of this. What we're talking about. Uh, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, and and their sons kneeling down and asked. Jesus for something. She says, well, he says, well, what do you wish? What do you, what's, what's your vision? Right? What do you wish? What do you want? What do you want to see? Right? What do you want to see? And she said, oh, grant that my two sons uh, of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your on your left, in your kingdom. He says, you do not know what you ask. You do not know. You, you have no. You are asking from from superficial vision, from from physical picturing here. You're talking about a couple of guys getting up on the platform and receiving a ribbon, man. We're not talking about that. And then you go across the page, and you got these two blind guys who cannot see physically. but are crying out, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And what are they saying? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's where we get this. What do you want me to do for? What do you want me to do in and through you? So here's this picture. This is a beautiful contrast of being able to see Physically, but yet not seeing with your soul, with the very depths of your heart. And here's a picture of someone who cannot see physically, but, but loud and clear they can see Jesus. And don't you find that interesting that Paul was struck blind? <laughs> and in his blindness, he saw clearer than he ever did in his whole life. So the, the blindness wasn't for us to sit here one day, 2,000 years later, and say, look, look how Jesus healed all of his blindness. He was struck blind so that he could see. 
The kingdom is world kingdom. Kingdom world. It's completely contrast. Turn the world upside down. Maybe we need to be blinded so that we can see. Maybe our our sight needs to be taken away. Maybe we need to somehow cast off the the physical stuff. Quit looking at the physical as if it was some kind of revelation from God and just get into the fact that just get into Him and let Him be able to see through you. So you could see how He sees. Uh, and lastly, Job. Job 42 is really the is a great example of this. I mean, Job's wife, uh, his friends, uh, Elihu and uh, Eliphaz and uh, Bildad and Zophar. I mean, they all have, they all you're all you're speaking of you're living in your vision statement. How we live our lives out is a proclamation of our vision statement. So it's not what you see, but who you see that produces this vision statement. So you get to the very end of Job, before his fortune is restored. That's really important for you. Because I've heard some of you teaching that, well, you know, Job knew he was going to get it back in the end anyway, so whoop de doo he went through it because, you know, God's that good. Or, you know, Jesus knew that he was going to get raised from the dead, so it wasn't such a big deal to go through everything he did on the cross, because, you know, he knew he wasn't really going to be dead forever anyway. Wow. You know how messed up that sounds? Yeah. So you get in Job 42. In, in all Job wants God to do, his whole deal is that, hey, his whole, the promise that he's standing on is what? God will show up. God will speak to me. He'll speak. He'll speak. And through all the all the temptation, all of the pain, all the loss, all the so, uh, sorrow, all of the the physical ailments, all of the the, the cursing because it was cursing that went back and forth between him and his friends, and you know they just they cursed, curse, and his, what, his wife said, "Why don't you just curse God?" Curse God and die. And God shows up in a whirlwind. I mean, a whirlwind. And then look at the very end of chapter 42, or the beginning of chapter 42. God speaks, and in, in, in Job's, his, his prayer is answered, right? God speaks. And then here's how Job answers the Lord and says, verse 42. I know that you can do everything. Hey, we just said something about that. Didn't we? One of those verses up there? We sang about it. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Hey, God is sovereign, right? You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hey, I, by faith, right? Yeah, by faith I live this thing, right? Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But see, it doesn't just stop there. Because look where this has taken him. Now he says, but now my eye sees you. We have no indication that I've found so far that God shows up to Job in a, in a vision that he can see physically. Right? We know God gets, speaks to Job, but we don't know that, hey, God and Job sat down and had breakfast. Let's say there was God sitting across the table. But look how we, this, look at the culmination of this. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye, that's important, my eye, this is like this soul focus, sees you. 
How does he see him? The eye, his soul, man, the very inside of him. Job can see God. And for those of you who aren't quite sure if you can see God, it's not that if you can, it's when are you gonna? It's not that, well, you know, some of us get to, well, he's the pastor, I guess he gets a little more than we do, so he'll get to see him because he stands up every day higher than we do or up there. No, it's, it's not that you're wondering if you're going to. It's, it's like almost you have to see God. You're going to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the reason we don't see Him, not like this, but like this, is that something's wrong in here. If you want to see him in here, this has got to be cleansed. And that's the deal. That's our vision statement. So I just want to get wrapped up into him. I just want, just want to focus on him. See, I can think of the 25 greatest things I want my kids to do. But if I don't focus on him... Those things go like this. And next thing I know, I'm just focusing on those things. Come on now. Come on now. And then where's he in all this? So this is going to be like that. So I've got to stay wrapped up in him. This is why we have this cross here to remind us, man. This is it. The center of it all. <sighs> Oh, Jesus, will you now become our vision statement? Will you now become our, our vision, what we see? I mean, isn't that why Peter began to sink in the water? It wasn't that the water got too rough. It wasn't that Peter's shoes and sandals got a little soggy and he sunk he, he, he took his eyes off of you. Uh, so we sit here and we think of all the people that we come in contact each week with and, and those that have come and gone and, and those that we want to see and, and we cry out for, for more souls and, and we're, are we still thinking about ways to try and draw them in or are we just going to just think about you or are we just going to get into you and let you live in and through us? So that you become our vision statement. You, Jesus. You're, you're the vision. And without you, we perish. Oh, we know that for sure. So why, ch why change it up? Without you, we perish. Our good deeds become filthy rags without you. Our vision becomes blurred without you. Our vision becomes self-centered without you. You've got to be our vision. Jesus is our vision. May it be so. Teach us. Show us again. So that your spirit in our spirit, line up. It's the Spirit, by the Spirit, that we know. It's by the Spirit that we can see. And it's by the Spirit that we proclaim this cure that we have for sin, for self-centeredness. Run wild in us. Uh, show up in a whirlwind to us. Blind us so we can see. Transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.